Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. They have a little box for me. So I won't be just a little sober floating head. You can can see me. Hello, everybody. My name is Leslie. I'm an alcoholic. I'm also a recovering crystal methamphetamine addict. Um, I toss that out only because uh, I'm a very firm believer that alcoholism is the disease. Uh, It manifests itself in in many, many ways, thus the plethora of 12-step programs, uh, I read recently that crystal methamphetamine addiction in West Hollywood, California is at the epidemic level, and I find that really, really frightening. Out of the seven sponsees that I, that I, uh, that I work with, they all had, uh, not only an alcohol, but a, a crystal methamphetamine problem. I think in gay men especially, it gets tied up in sexual urges, which is a lethal combination. And, uh, so I just toss that out. I, anyway, people come up to me afterwards. I realize and I honor that this isn't a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, but, um, um, I tweaked a whole lot. And <laughs> when you're, when you're 42 years old and still doing speed, it is not pretty. Um, <laughs> But I, uh, I'd also like to welcome anyone who's new and all our returnees to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'd like to tell you something that was, that saved my life. I walked into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous at 42 years of age. I looked around and I thought, so it's come to this. (laughs) I didn't see anyone hip. I didn't see anyone happening, which is something I had chased for years and years. I love what Joni Mitchell says about hip. She says it's a herd mentality. Um, and and uh, Madonna pierces her navel and everybody does it and then they're hip. But, you know, it's a herd mentality. Now, what I found in Alcoholics Anonymous is that we don't follow the herd, you know, and I like that now. Um, but that's not what I noticed when I first came into these meetings. And I was overwhelmed. People were telling me things that I had to do, and I was just trying to get through that day without using crystal methamphetamine and and without taking a drink. Um, And so somebody came up to me. I don't remember who. I just remember what they said to me. I think they saw how overwhelmed I was. Um, And they said, you know, the only thing, honey, that you really have to worry about is this. Get a meeting directory and do not leave this room today without knowing when your next meeting is. We suggest 90 in 90, uh, 90 meetings in 90 days. But you don't have to worry right now. You're going to hear a lot about sponsorship. You're going to hear a lot about the steps. But I'm telling you right now, all you have to worry about is do not leave this room without knowing when your next meeting is. And I hung on to that. You know, it was something simple. And I'd like to say that to anyone who's new, because I know that if you're doing meetings, especially these 90 meetings in 90 days, the steps will happen. Sponsorship will happen. All of that will happen, you know. And, and, and if you're, if you're feeling overwhelmed and you're new, like, like I was feeling overwhelmed, and, and you, you notice that we're laughing at things that you don't think are funny. <laughs> I remember sitting there thinking, you know, I earn a living at this, okay? Um, and this is not funny. Whatever whatever this is that you guys are chuckling over, like the town drunks, I don't think it's funny. But uh, but um, I, uh, through the fellowship that I found in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, which replaced the fellowship of the Spotlight Lounge, where I ended up. That's where I drank near the end. Now, for those of you who don't know very quickly, the Spotlight Lounge, you go through strips of carpeting to get through the door. I don't know why. Um, I guess to keep out the light. I really don't know. It's strips of carpeting. And it's... Um, it's, it's old. I just have to say there's nothing sadder than an old, drunk homosexual. 
There is just nothing on the face of this earth that is sadder than a tired old drunk queen (laughs) sitting there as I sat from about 12 noon. Um, The denizens of the Spotlight Lounge are about 30 days out of Soledad Prison. Most of them have a rock cocaine habit, so they're willing to turn a trick for $40 to, um, to support their habit. And they're young and they're tattooed and they have uh, chipped teeth and, and dirty fingernails and they were right up my alley. Oh. Oh. Most of them were not homosexual. It was a gay for pay thing, you know, which was right up my alley. Big part of my story. Um, and there I sat with a cocktail and a, you know, a, a, a little baggie of crystal in my pocket to lure them home and a checkbook. And, uh, and that's, you know, where I ended up. And yet I walked into a room of Alcoholics Anonymous and looked around and thought, so it's come to this. <laughs> Go figure. But through the fellowship that I found in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, which replaced the fellowship of the Spotlight Lounge, through um, rigorously working the 12 steps to the very best of my ability, and if you're new, perk up here, um, applying these steps in my life on a day-to-day basis when problems arise, because I don't believe that we just work the steps, we live the steps, especially 10, 11, and 12. So through the fellowship that I found in the rooms, through rigorously working the steps, and through on a daily basis seeking a power greater than myself, seeking being the operative word for this alcoholic, that is usually the thrust of my speech because it's been, it's been my biggest struggle, is finding this, this, this power greater than myself that I can turn my will and my life over to on a daily basis. Um, through doing those th- three things, I have not... Uh, I have not had a drink. I have not um, done any crystal math, uh, any anything uh, that has affected me from the neck up since October 20th, 1997. And for that, I am profoundly grateful. That means I'll be eight. And I'm telling you right now, in terms of miracles, that's up there a little bit below the Immaculate Conception. That is a miracle, if you knew me. Um, I... Uh, I I grew up in the hills of Tennessee. I, I don't know what your first clue would be, but uh, I do. You know, my mother and my grandmother uh, took one look at little Leslie, and they thought, "Oh, he's gonna need some help." And <laughs> because you see, my dad was a lieutenant colonel in the army. Um, well, my grandmother and my mother took one look at little Leslie, and they. Uh, they circle the wagons, as only good Southern women can do. And they created a little secret garden where it was okay for little boys to play with dolls. It was okay for little boys to um, read uh, Trixie Belden and Nancy Drew instead of those hardy boys. Uh, it was okay for little boys to sew doll clothes and make pot holders. I was very artistic. Um, <laughs> It was okay for this little boy to do whatever he wanted, except, shh, 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 shh. no, honey, um, let's not show daddy. <laughs> and so I think that my earliest memories, um, I think I just sort of fell out of the womb ashamed, and I fell out of the w- womb afraid. And in retrospect, I realized when I got into the rooms and started doing some step work that every decision I have ever made, especially in my adult life, has either been shame or fear-based. And um, I, don't, I don't do that today. That is a direct result of, of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to tell you very quickly, um, because I grew up with so much shame and so much fear, I'm here in town not only to give this talk, but I, I'm doing a, a show. And so at the Majestic next weekend, more about that later on. But anyway, <laughs> you might want to go to my website, www.brotherboy.com, to order your tickets. But anyway, so... Uh, um, <laughs> 
But they gave me this wonderful party. Two lesbians here in town gave me a lovely press party, and they told me the most wonderful story. They One was married and lost her son when he was six um, because she came out of the closet and uh, moved in with her lesbian lover. The little boy decided at eight that he wanted to live with his mother and her lesbian lover. The little boy is now 17, and he ran for high school president, and his signs that he put up, his name is Mike, he said, vote for Mike, because my mom's a dyke, and they know how to get things done. And he... (laughs) He won. He won. I was so flabbergasted. I said, does he go to public public school here in Texas, here in Dallas? Well, all of a sudden, here came this little amazing boy, 17 years old, with his little Wranglers and that little cowboy hat and all his buddies, and, and it was a homo hoedown. I mean, there were all this this party, and I stood there and watched this little guy, 17 years old, who was raised by these two amazing lesbians, whole court. I mean, just hell court. Those queens were just fascinated with this little, just blah, blah, blah. And I sat there, and I thought, you know what? Even with all that we're going through in the world today, it is a good time to be gay. I thought, you know, it's a good time to be sober. And the most amazing thought that I had was, I thought, and it's a real good time to be Leslie. And I have to tell you that I came into this program with such self-loathing and so much shame and so much guilt and so much fear that to have that thought was just, and that is a direct result of the program, the power of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. That is a direct result. Now, if you had asked me at 42 years of age when I came into the program, um, are you openly gay? Are you a proud gay man? I would say, honey, I've, I've ridden on floats, you know, but. And I fell out of the womb and landed in my mother's high heels. I mean, people, people, people ask me all the time, Leslie, honey, when did you come out? And I think, well, come out. You know, one had to have been in <laughs> to, to come out. But you know what is odd? You, at 42 years of age, you took away my medicine. You took away my medicine. I realized that I started getting high when I was 14. I've never walked into a gay bar sober in my life. And all of a sudden, 42 years old, I walk into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and you tell me that I cannot drink, and I cannot tweak, and I cannot do ecstasy. I can't do anything. And I realized I was riddled with internal homophobia. Riddled. I didn't know how to be gay. I didn't know how to act. I didn't know, I I just didn't know how to be gay, and especially not to do it sober. And so, you know, my journey for these last seven, almost eight years into sobriety has been this amazing journey into my queerdom, you know? It has been because my first sponsor, who was straight, said to me, you know, honey, you are a fag-hating fag. And I said, no, I don't hate fags. I hate Nelly fags. <laughs> he said, hello. <laughs> but, you know, it's what, we, it's, it's what we hate within myself. And I love what my dear friend Del Shores said in one of his plays. It was sitting every Sunday morning in a pew in the Baptist church is where I learned to hate myself. You know, that is where I learned to hate myself. Y'all, I've been baptized 14 times. <laughs> Every time the preacher would say, come forward, lost sinner, and they would start singing, just as I am. I was up and down the aisle. My mother would say, son, you're already saved. Remain seated. <laughs> I was filled with so much shame. I was filled with so much guilt. I was filled, and I'll get to all of that. We've gotten way off course here. Where were we? Oh, my mother, and I was, 
And my dad was a lieutenant colonel in the Army. We're just going to free form through this. Uh, um, and so my dad was a lieutenant colonel in the Army, and my dad was in possession of this. It's an easy kind of masculinity that I am in awe of. Starkey has it a little bit. It's that, you know, it's that, it's that, <laughs> you know, it's that, it's that easy, easy kind of masculinity that I am, I'm in awe of, I'm terrified of, I'm real attracted to, but we're, we're not going to go down that road because we would never find our way back. But I, <laughs> But, you know, my dad had it, and I didn't have it, you know. And it was this glaring sort of difference, because I loved my dad. And, you know, I found out in sobriety that my dad loved me, you know. Oh, he loved me. My daddy used to call me son as if he was in deep pain. He would say, oh, son. <laughs> Because he would come home, and I was—I used to love this TV show called um, Hullabaloo. It was y'all are probably too young, some of you, but it was way before MTV, and it was a dance show, and they had go-go dancers on white cubes, and I was transfixed. <laughs> and I would shove all the furniture back in the house, and I had a little, you know, a little record player, and I had one album. It was um, one little forty-five, and you'd put the little plastic piece in the middle and turn it 45 or 33. Some of y'all thinking, what the fuck is he talking about? But some of you know. And you'd put the little plastic piece in the middle, and it was a uh, wipeout by the safaris. And it, <laughs> they go... <laughs> My poor daddy... My poor daddy would come home with all of his army buddies. <laughs> He'd just say, oh, son. <laughs> and mama, my mother was a champion baton twirler. <laughs> Aren't they all in Tennessee? But she, my mother, I remember one summer afternoon, m mama got out this baton and she taught me a routine. We were out in the front yard. And I was really, really good. And my daddy comes pulling up with all of his army buddies. <laughs> and uh, in my big, high, squeaky voice, I said, Daddy! Daddy! Uh, watch, watch me! Watch me twirl! And I remember he just said, Oh, son. He said... <laughs> Son, why why don't you uh, twirl in the house? And I said, I said, well, Mama's afraid I'll break something. He said, Son, I'll pay for whatever you break. Please just twirl that little baton in the house. But you know, my dad, my daddy, my daddy was killed in a plane crash when I was 11 years old, and I knew. At 11 years old, I knew to the very core of my being that he went to his grave somewhat ashamed to have a son like me. And, you know, at 11, I didn't even know what like me meant. And I, I have to tell you that through working the 12 steps and, and being around these rooms, I went home uh, a couple of years ago, and when we were little, we would hang a sheet in the living room, and Mother had this old slide projector, and we would watch slides. Of, we loved to do that of when we were kids. And I was leafing through the slides, and do you know on every picture of me in my daddy's handwriting, it said, my pride and joy. And you know, that's something that I don't think I would have even realized had I not done a lot of work in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, he was a good man. He, he, I get my sense of humor from my dad. Um, I love, uh, I don't want to use her line, someone, he was doing the best he could with the light he had to see with. That's not my line. You're going to hear that later, maybe. But, um, I, I, um, I do believe, I do not want anyone that's new to think that I'm in any way insinuating 
that because I grew up a little fag, you know, and felt I was a disappointment to my dad, that that's why I'm an alcoholic. You know, all my life I thought if I can find people like me, I'm going to be okay. And, you know, I began this drug-fueled alcohol journey that took me finally to West Hollywood. Well, honey, there's queers hanging from the trees. And (laughs) I think the loneliest I have ever been was sitting in a gay bar. You know, I think it's so funny. I haven't been to bars in years, but now in my day, when you went to bar, if you wanted to get a trick, see, that's what we went to bars for. Called your friend the next day, did you get a trick? (laughs) Well, if you wanted to get a trick, you couldn't go screaming around that bar. You had to butch it up. You know, you had to act masculine or you couldn't get a trick. They're not going to go home with the nearly screamy ones. And so I thought, you know, in retrospect, I couldn't even be myself with my tribe, you know. And I thought all my life, if I could just find people like me, and then all of a sudden I find my tribe and I think I'm still alone. I'm still, you know, feeling this way. And I I walked into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous on October 20th, 1997, and I swear to you, I exhaled for the first time in my life. And I just knew, I mean, many people say, you know, I just sort of knew, even though I looked around and didn't like it, I knew that I had found people like me. And what a relief to finally realize at 42 years of age, it has nothing to do, all that therapy, all that chanting, the old Buddhist, I did everything, nam myoho renge ko, get my ass on the Letterman show, I, you know, <laughs> chanting and, oh, I've just, I've done the S, I've climbed the mountain, I've done, you know, all of that, it had nothing to do with the fact that I was homosexual and then I was disappointed by my dad, I'm an alcoholic, you know, and there is a solution. What a relief just to know, you know, that. When I was, when I was, I was 14 years old in 1969. And all I wanted out of life in, in the hills of Tennessee was sitting there. I wanted to be a hippie. I read everything there was to read about the hippie movement. I read about the hate Ashbury section in San Francisco. I read about Woodstock. I saw, um, go, go tell Alice, this made for TV movie. Um, I grew my hair. Really, I looked like a, a little sort of rock and roll troll doll. I had <laughs> I was sort of on the cusp of hippiedom and glitter rock. 1969, and I shoehorned my fat little ass into this pair of ice blue satin pants, and I special ordered from Canada a pair of silver Elton John platform shoes. And I would stagger around that town, and um, (laughs) I'd never even been high. I just added that stagger for effect. I just knew. (laughs) So, but, you know, there was a boy in my school that I had a crush on, and he said the magic words to me one day. He leaned into me, and he said, hey, you want to get wasted? I said, Yes! God, I needed a cocktail when I was three. I've, I've waited so long. Yes, I want to get wasted. <laughs> Where do I line up? You know, I'm really, really grateful to drugs and alcohol. I don't think I would have made it through adolescence. I really don't. I, I, um, I, I, I don't think there's anybody on the face of this earth that likes to get high more than I do. I love everything about it, you know, but I've just found... And I'd probably be getting high today if I wasn't willing to pay the consequences for my actions and if I hadn't found something better. Um, but I, I'm, I'm a product of the 1960s. I don't know anything about um, a little white wine with the fish. I know how to get wasted. And, you know, that's my story. I don't want to get into a long drunk log. The, the 70s were a lot of you know, tripping on acid and smoking a lot of pot and Boone's Farm apple wine. And then the 80s rolled around. It was a lot of quaaludes and, and disco and and cocaine and, and making money. And then it was the 90s. And uh, what happened with me was 10 years before I got sober, I met a cowboy. And, honey, this none of the – I don't know what the cowboy bar is here, JR's, I think, or where they line dance. 
the roundup, where they look like cowboys, but they open their mouths and 50, 50 yards of purple chiffon come <laughs> flowing out. <laughs> Honey, I had... I had the real thing. He had a belt buckle you could serve a turkey on. <laughs> and those skin-tight Wranglers. And he was better looking than anything Hollywood ever, ever put out. Um, now, what I didn't know was he was the spawn of Satan and Hitler's sister, but <laughs> he, the night that I met him, he taught me, the night that I met this cowboy, he taught me how to inject crystal methamphetamine, and I fell in love. And thus began a 10-year descent into alcoholic, drug-induced madness. Um, I went to jail, I can't even tell you, five, six times. Um, it was an abusive relationship. I didn't think of it that way because I thought, you put two men under one roof from radically different socioeconomic upbringings. He was white trash, and I had risen above. But <laughs> he, he had my number. He said to me one time, he said, you're, you're two generations away from government cheese. So don't, because I told him that I remember government cheese. Y'all are way too young to remember that, but that was for really poor, poor people. But he, um, he beat me. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. We would, we would get, uh, we drank every day and then we shot speed to get high and, um, he beat me, you know. I got smacked a lot. Now, I don't know how. I'm not butch enough to punch, but, boy, I can bitch slap. And I also can hit you. I'll grab something, you know, a, a bottle, a kitchen chair. And I learned how to fight. You know, I had to. I would get the shit stomped out of me. And um, the police were at our house quite a bit, and, and, and I would just, you know, tell them that it was just a little domestic disturbance, and they would say, Mr. Jordan, he was brandishing a crossbow. And I said, well, he shot me with it last week, but, I mean, he's just a little misguided, and, you know. But I, you know, I see now in retrospect, I mean, I make light of it, but I'll see these women on television that are beat up, and I'll think, honey, the first time he smacked me, I'd be out of there. But you know what? Until you're in that situation, you have no idea what a trap that is. You know, I, I my self-esteem was so low that I blamed myself. You know, I can remember giving these talks to myself, saying, saying, you knew he was coming off speed. You knew he hadn't eaten in six days. You knew that his blood sugar level was whacked, and yet you kept on, and so you got smacked, you know? But... I, I bring that up because I have found my disease is, is so cunning, baffling, and powerful that even though you take away the drugs and the alcohol, I get addicted to people, you know? I don't know. I'm, I'm learning, but I don't know how to love in a healthy and blessed way. Um, I go to other programs for that, but, you know, I think that, that Alcoholics Anonymous has helped me in many ways learn how to not look to other people for my happiness. You know, the minute that I find myself looking outside of me at whatever for my happiness, I know that, that I'm in trouble. But this guy, I was so addicted to him, um, and he was just dumb as a box of rocks. I, I mean, I'm, I'm educated. I, you know, I have a college degree, and this is a man. He was so dumb. One time. He would talk incessantly. Now, I did, too. We were both on speed, but I had <laughs> I had things to say. He just he just sort of blah, 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 with no segue, no blah, blah, blah. And one day, I could just tune him out, but one day he said to me, you know, he used to call me baby. He sounded just like Elvis, and I would be screaming at him, telling him, you need to get a job. You sit on your fat ass by that swimming pool, and I have to act all day and emote and blah, blah, blah. he said, oh, come here, baby. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> and then he'd open his robe and say, what about all this, baby? <laughs> oh. <laughs> it was like the eighth wonder of the world. <laughs> but, um, 
he, you know, he said to me, I have a lot of respect for Willie Nelson. And I said, what brought that on? He said, well, all the work he does for him, people that's got AIDS. And I said, Willie Nelson? He said, well, for the farmers that got farm AIDS. He thought... <laughs> He thought farm aids was for farmers. He said, well, you know, you don't think about it, but I guess farmers get it and Willie's there for him. And I said, please don't tell anybody that, what you just said. But, but he finally, he really did, he shot me with a crossbow and he, he went to jail um, for for uh, attempted murder, and I'm the one that he attempted to murder. And I, as far as I know, he sits. He was extradited. He was from Weatherford, right outside here, and uh, he was extradited back to. And as far as I know, sits down at uh, um, oh B Church of Brazelton, uh, right anywhere where the prison is down there. No, it wasn't where you were, honey. I think it was at. A- <laughs> Name all those you were at, and I'll tell you which one. <laughs> I love me some Starkey. I do. But um, anyway, he he uh, he went to jail, and I thought that it was over, and it had only really just begun. There were about four more years, you know, of just insanity, and I finally ended up doing uh, a four-month stint in the Twin Towers, uh, downtown Los Angeles. I walked out of there and I found my way into a room of Alcoholics Anonymous because I knew the gig, the jig was up. And if you're new, I hope that you just know the jig is up. Um, and only you know that, you know, that the jig is just up. Um, my heart was broken. My spirit was crippled. I was a dead man walking. I ended up in, in this, I don't even remember how I got there. It was a straight, AA meeting. I encourage a lot of my sponsees. I love gay AA, but I tell you what, especially gay men, we don't know how to socialize. We know how to sexualize, but we do not know, most gay men, it has been my experience, do not know how to look someone in the eye and put their hand out and say, hello, my name is Leslie, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous, without some baggage attached. And I learned to do that in straight AA. And I encourage my sponsees to uh, to check out some straight meetings. You want to drop anchor where you're comfortable, of course. So we want to be with our tribe. But I learned how to put my hand out, and I think it's because gay men and gay women, we were raised with a secret, and we were so afraid that somebody was going to find out. It's really hard for us to just look people in the eye and put our hand out, especially when we first come in here. Um, I wandered into this room of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I had on my armor. I love seeing uh, newcomers when they come in with their motorcycle jackets and their sunglasses. I had on a fishing hat, and this I had this big raincoat. And uh, I sat on the front row, and uh, I was able, without any prompting, to put my hand up and say, my name is Leslie, I'm an alcoholic, and I'm also a, a drug addict. And I sat, and I was able to listen But as gregarious and and outgoing, and this seems so weird that not even eight years ago, I had shot speed for so long that my synapses were not firing correctly. Um, I was so riddled with with speed and alcohol. Newcomer, it takes a long time just to physically get sober. I have to tell you, at three years, I don't want to scare anybody, but at three years of sobriety, I got a deep tissue massage. And I walked out the door, and I was high. I've since read a lot about crystal methamphetamine, and it it, it, it lodges in your in your tissue. It even gets in your bone marrow. And I called my wonderful sponsor, Don Norman, and I said, Don, I, I'm I'm high, and it's it's from a massage. And he said, No, baby, it's probably just feelings coming up. I said, No, it's not feelings coming up. I'm tweaking. I should know. <laughs> I was high for 10 years. I should know the difference between feelings coming up. I said, Don, I'm high. My palms are sweaty. It's like three days off of speed. And I had to ride it out. And I am convinced that was the last hurrah. I think it took that long. You know, newcomer, I don't think we talk enough about these rooms about just diet and exercise. Eight hours of sleep can do wonders for your sobriety. You know, and I have discovered in in 
see that I wish they would do studies of blood sugar levels in people have this gene, alcoholics, because I have discovered in sobriety that sugar is the enemy. Now, when I came in years ago, they said baths and chocolate. I'm telling you, for this alcoholic, sugar is the enemy, and it makes me gripey, and it makes me mean, and there are times I stay off of him sugar the whole, in, in, in my sobriety, but occasionally I'll have a bite of cake or something, and the next day I wake up and I want to smack somebody. <laughs> And I will sit in a meeting of AA, and if I don't like your shirt, I'll plot your murder. <laughs> and people, people think I'm just the sweetest little old thing, and I'm sitting there plotting your murder. And, and on those days, I have learned that on those days, because sometimes I'll berate myself and I'll say, you need to start working a, big, a better program, or maybe you're not the... No, I had cake. It's that simple. <laughs> I had cake. I'm working a fine program, thank you very much. These are the talks that I have with myself. And, and I know that on those days, I do not make any decisions. I know those days. I have to write it out, just like you did coming off a drunk. To write it out. I do not make decisions. I know to not try to put my shit on you because I had cake. So I'm not going to try my best to just get through the day and not put my shit on you on those days, you know. My first sponsor told me, name the committee. Give, her, give, give, it, give it a name. Well, her name is Thelma Lou. And she's Southern Baptist. She big, oh, she big woman. You could move in. She, she wears her big high hairdo and she chatters incessantly. And she gets up real early. Oh, she's waiting. There's mornings when I open my eyes and, oh, she just going, you little sissy, you're never going to work on TV again. Who would let a sissy like you up on the big screen and look at you funny looking and go look in that mirror and look at those ears and who got hair on your back? Now, that's the gay cardinal sin. Look at you. <laughs> and how could anybody ever love you? And you got to pay for sex and look at you and, oh, blah, blah. She just goes and goes. And I think, tell her, thank you, Thelma Lou, for sharing. But you know what? That's not true. But there are days like when I have cake, I can, Thelma Lou's on a tear and I cannot shut her up. And those are the days I just have to get through the day, you know, just get through the day. But I walked into that meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and I put up my hand and I said, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an I'm a alcoholic, I'm a drug addict. And at the very end of the meeting, they asked, would our newcomer like to uh, share? Uh, oh, God. Now, this is what happened, which in, in, in many ways is sort of divine. But I couldn't, my synapses w wouldn't fire correctly. I don't know if any of you have done speed for a long time. You, you get where you can't speak. And I couldn't speak. But my acting training kicked in. It was the oddest thing. You know, I couldn't talk one-on-one -on -one to you. I, it, it freaked, I mean, my, I just thought my bowels would let go. I thought I'd just shit and fall back in it. If I, if I had to talk to you, I was so scared. But this acting training kicked in, and I, it just came flowing out on a group level in front of all these people. And I talked about all that shame and all that fear. And then when I got through, I was sitting on the front row, and I, as I, I'm not exactly a pillar of masculinity. And when I get nervous, my voice gets in the upper register. Um, even now, I mean, this happens on a daily basis, on the telephone especially. People say, ma'am. And I say, I'm not a ma'am, I'm a sir. I'm a gay sir, but I am a sir. And I, but this, they called on Big Mikey, this, this guy from Brooklyn, um, Big, big hulking Mikey, who, by the way, newcomer, told my story. You are going to hear your story. You stick around these rooms, and you're going to hear your story from the most unlikely source. That's why I've been taught to not discount anybody, you know. I was taught to every listen to everybody. What you can't use, it's like a big smorgasbord. Oh, I can use, no, honey, no, no, don't need any of that. This, 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 this. And, and you put the rest under the chair in front of you because that bullshit that that queen is spouting who shares every goddamn week, <laughs> shut her up. What you don't understand is this new person may be just listening with bated breath and may hear that pearl of wisdom that you think, God, she sings that same shit every week. <laughs> shut her up. 
You know, I've learned, and you know what? The longer I'm around, the more, the less that bothers me. It's so weird. I don't notice that. And I would sit in AA meetings, and people drove me crazy. But um, they called on Big Mikey, who um, said uh, uh, to the young lady who just got out of jail. <laughs> Y'all, I was horrified. I mean, I don't know what your button is. Maybe you grew up fat or maybe you grew up poor. Or Mine is that I was this little sissy kid who, you know, in dodgeball, smear the queer. It was like open season. And, <laughs> ah! Ah! <laughs> but I, um, when he said to the young lady that just got out of jail, my heart stopped. Because I thought I had found a place where I could maybe, you know, deal with all this addiction problems I had. And everybody just gasped. And then it made it even worse because they kept saying, Mikey, that's not a girl. That's a guy. It's an old white-haired man. And <laughs> <laughs> the oldest girl in the world. <laughs> but... um. But I I tried to get out of that meeting. I thought, well, this is not for me if I'm going to be publicly humiliated. And so he chased me down, and he got a hold of me. And y'all, he had tears in his eyes. This big old guy, and he said, I sure do hope that you do not think that I was uh, making fun of you. Um, I I, I, I couldn't hear. I was way in the back. I I tell you, I just wasn't paying attention. He went on and on. And then he said the magic words. See, we have those slogans all over the walls that we just spout here and spout there. And we don't realize that there may be a newcomer who has never heard. I didn't know you ask everybody to keep coming back. I didn't. I thought he was, and you know, I was raised Southern. He said, I hope that you come back. And I was raised by a a Southern mother, and manners are very important. I thought I had to RSVP, and I was... God, what a quandary. So I said, okay. And, you know, that was October 20th, 1997. And uh, because of, of him inviting me back, I have not had a drink or, or a drug in almost eight years. And when I walked into the rooms, they they sort of tricked me, I think. I think they saw a patsy. The Moore Park meeting, which was my home group for many, many years, um, has different, it's not a clubhouse, it's in one beautiful room at a church, but every single day has a different secretary, thus every meeting has a new cleanup person. But somehow they tricked me into thinking that my job was to mop the floors. Every day, I've never mopped a floor in my life. I had seen on TV that S thing that they do, you know, like that. But let me tell you how... Something divine was afoot because there was a mop closet. I would sit. I had my assign. It was my seat. You know, I, I earned my seat. You know, if someone sat in it, I would ask them. I'd say, you know, I usually sit there because I'm the cleanup person and I have to get over here to the mop. And what I would do is the minute the meeting was over because I could not deal with people, I would go into the closet. Only time I've ever been in the closet, but I would... <laughs> This seems so weird. It was only eight years ago. I would get in that closet, and I'd pee out, and I'd wait till everybody left. And you know, Moore Park looks out over this beautiful garden. It's in a Unitarian church, and it's wooden floors. It's a dance. Uh, it's their dance uh, uh, room where they have have danced. So there's a lot of mirrors. And I would roll that little yellow, big old yellow mop bucket out, and I would begin here. And I would slowly mop, you know, this way. And then I would put the mop in the dirty water, and I'd go back that way. And I would think, you know, about the meeting, what was said, and, you know, that's the best I could do. And I have to tell you, newcomer, that we I mopped my way to sobriety. I did. And I think that the way in which, as it's said around these rooms, that we get our self-esteem is we do esteemable acts and I took pride. I sort of fagged it up. I would. I got curtains, and, and uh, I'd clean the mirrors. And two ladies that ran the church came up to me, and they said, you know, uh, young man, we, 
We have had AA meetings in here for 20 some odd years and we've never seen anyone take the kind of pride that you take in this room. And I had to go into the bathroom and I had to sit there in a stall and just sob. You know, I have had huge things happen to me in my life. In the 1980s, I had everything an actor could want, the six-figure salary, the TV series, the movies. I did it, you know, and nothing, nothing in my life. I'm more proud of, of keeping that room clean. And when I turned when I turned a year, they gave me a big mop with a bow. <laughs> and... Uh, but the big problem I had was that you guys told me that I had to find a power greater than myself. And because I tell you what I believe, um, this is kind of a strong statement, but I believe when I was young and I was very, very, very impressionable, I think that there were people who came to me under the guise of religion. I think there were people who came to me with their stern, their punishing God. They came to me with their bigotry their hypocrisy, their crushing self-righteousness, and they raped my very fragile psyche. I suffer from a spiritual malady. It is near to impossible for me to believe. And so when I walked into these rooms, I thought, I don't know how I'm going to stay sober because I don't believe in God. I made a conscious decision when I was 17 years old. It does not make sense to me. Where is... AIDS in the equation. Where is the tsunami? You know, I thought for sure the Baptists were going to jump on that and say, well, God had to wipe out those Buddhists and Hindus. You know, I, where, where, you know, my mother, my sweet, sweet mother, who we've had discussions, finally said to me, and I, her heart was breaking when she said this to me. She said, son, the way that you were raised, do you believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. And I said, yes, ma'am, I do. But I also believe in the divinity of Mohammed. I believe in the divinity of Buddha. I believe in the divinity of all the great teachers. And mother, I also believe in my own divinity as a teacher and a seeker. And, you know, it broke her heart. Um, when I would say as a little boy, well, mother... What about all those little children over there in China that never knew about Jesus? She said, well, honey, that's why we have missionaries. You know, they just have an answer for everything. But I didn't know what I was going to do. And I'll tell you my journey. This is the way it began. There was this little sweet lady named Miss Jane Gray. I love the old broads in AA. I don't know about y'all, but... Most drug addicts and alcoholics I know are charming. We learn how to, we can charm our way. Out of, you can't charm those old broads in AA. At least I couldn't. Mm -mm. Sit down and shut up, honey. I spilt more than you drank. Now sit over there and shut up. <laughs> and I couldn't charm them. And they were not charmed. And you know, you see how cute and adorable I am. <laughs> and when I drank, I was precious. <laughs> Oh, I was just precious. Well, I couldn't charm those ladies. And Miss Jane Gray came up to me, and she said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little something to do. Honey, listen, the whole God thing, you're just you're like a dog on a bone, and you're just chewing on it too much. She said, here, I'll tell you what to do. Get you a bar of soap, and on your bathroom mirror in the morning when you shave, I want you to write H-E-L-P. Now, honey, what that stands for is his or her ever-loving presence. And all you have to do is you shave and just say, help. I said, Miss Gray, the problem is I don't know who I'm saying. <laughs> you also need to learn to shut up now. Because <laughs> I'm giving you something to do. Now, as you go through the day, after you say help... You go through the day when you lose your footing, you get a little squirrely. I want you to find a quiet place. Go in a public bathroom, wherever you can go, and I want you to breathe in. Now, look here, honey. That's, that's cool air. Try it. Breathe in. See, that's cool air. Now, I want you to breathe out. Warm air. That's life, baby. That's life. I want you to just say help. 
And then at the end of the day, I want you to take a washcloth. I want you to write thank you. Wash off the help and just write thank you. Go to bed. Your life's going to get better. And you know what it did? Something that simple. You know, see, the beautiful, beautiful part about Alcoholics Anonymous is that our concept of God can grow and can change as we grow and change. Enlightenment, you know, we move into the light. And I that worked for me for a really long time, and then it didn't work. And then it's so wonderful that I'm speaking here in Dallas, Texas, because I had this wildly cathartic thing happened at the Richland Hills Church of Christ, which is out here in Fort Worth, Texas. My dear friend, Dr. Peavy, who's not in this program, said to me, I was going, I had fallen in love with a newcomer, and I was in a fetal position on the bathroom floor at five years of sobriety, and I was saying to myself, I did not get sober and go through all I went through and all this work to feel this way, and I didn't know what to do about it. And uh, I called my sponsor, and I said, for the first time, I'm going to run because I'm scared I'll drink, but I'm just going to, and I drove to Texas. So Dr. Peavy said, honey, let me just, I can see you're in such pain. Let me take you to church. I said, oh, God, why not? I'd rather get beat with a stick. I grew up in the church, Wayne. I was spoon-fed the Bible from the time I was a little bitty baby. I don't believe any of it. And, you know, just for shock value. I said, I don't believe Jonah lived in the belly of a whale. I don't believe that Ruth turned back and turned into salt. I think those are wonderful fables to teach people, but I don't believe it. Oh, he said, oh, honey, oh, honey. So anyway, we tried it off. And please, 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 I'm not making fun of anybody's religion, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me reverence for anybody's spiritual journey. And I even, last Christmas, my mother, I went home and she said, would you go to church with me? And I thought, oh God. And I said, yes, ma'am. And I went to where I was baptized 14 times. I went, I went to the Central Baptist Church and I, I garnered what I did, what y'all taught me. I garnered what I could and left the rest under the pew in front of me. I left a lot under the pew in front of me. But I garnered. I garnered some. But I went to the Richland Hills Church of Christ, and the first thing I noticed was there was no piano or organ. And and Wayne said, no, honey, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. But it does not say with a piano or organ. You know, that is of the devil. And so... So the choir came out to sing, and y'all, they because there was no piano or organ, they sang in four-part harmony, and they sang a cappella, and it was the most beautiful music. And see, I was there to scoff. I was there to scoff. And I sat there, and then the preacher started. It was the same thing I heard. Come forward, lost sinner. See, you know what, Alcoholics Anonymous, I've lost the concept of sin. I don't sin today. What a concept. I make mistakes, you know, and I know what to do. But I, oh, I was an old, sinning, debauchee, cocksucking. Oh, I was, oh, you don't know, dirty little finger sniffing. I just, oh. Oh, I was a dirty, dirty little, when I walked in here, I was filthy. Filthy. Shame ridden. That's a true story. They told my mother when I was in kindergarten, they said, Miss Jordan, he puts his little fingers where they don't belong and sniffs them. <laughs> and, and, and my mother got mad because she said, but we shamed him. We shamed him. My mother said, all children do that. But I was shameful. And so I, you know, and all it took was that preacher, you know, come forward, lost sinner, and I was right back, just finger sniffing, <laughs> little sinner. Oh, I was a sinner. But you know, I looked around, and the most cathartic thing happened. I looked around at all those wonderful people, those good people. They're basically good people. They really are. They're good people sitting there in the Richland Hills Church of Christ in their little polyester suits. And uh, gluttony is not a sin at the Richland Hills Church of Christ, but (laughs) here they were. (laughs) Here they were sitting around there. And all I looked at their faces, and the Richland Hills Church of Christ is big as a shopping mall. It's huge. They even have screens, you know, for the preacher like they have at rock concerts. 
And I looked around, and all of a sudden, it hit me like a thunderbolt. I thought, my God, they believed. With this childlike faith, they believe. And I was so saddened because I thought, what I would give to just be able to put on my little polyester suit and, and go to the Richland Hills Church of Christ every Sunday morning and just lay my burdens down. But see, that's not my journey. It's not my journey. But I, th- I started thinking, you know, I thought, okay, look, sitting there in the Richland Hills Church of Christ, I thought, you know, what if I went my whole life, I didn't believe any of it, and then all of a sudden that rapture happens, and oh, we float up, and the pearly gates open, well, I'm just fucked. So, and then I thought, and then I thought, well, what if I went my whole life, and I, and I tried to believe in some way, and and then in the end, it's all bullshit, and we just float out into the universe, and there is no God, no anything. Well, I've had a pretty good life. And so that sort of began my journey. I began to act as if I believed. And I have to tell you, even today, most mornings on my knees reciting the third step prayer, I am talking to the walls. But I do what I have been taught to do, and today I seek See, what I seek is, is, is a God who will love me unconditionally. What I seek is a God who will look down with fatherly pride upon his handiwork and rejoice that I turned out the way I did. You know, I'm not a mistake. This is such an outside issue, but there's that Dr. Laura. Boy, what a corker. She thinks that, <laughs> she thinks we're genetic mistakes. Well, honey, there's 3.9 million of us in the United States alone. I don't know about you, Dr. Laura, but I choose to believe or at least seek a God who has a little bit better quality control. (laughs) Whoops, I made a mistake 3.9 million times. That's a pretty dizzy God, (laughs) Dr. Laura. She looks like an albino monkey with a wig on. <laughs> My friend told me, he said, I think she's, she's got that look. So many Republican women, I think their shoes are too tied. It's like, it's like they're trying to pass a peach pit. <laughs> I bet, I bet when Dr. Laura farts, only dogs can hear it. I bet. <laughs> Ooh, I'm talking nasty. But <laughs> But y'all, I want to wrap I want to wrap all this up. <laughs> Cuz y'all got me started now. See? God. The problem is I had identical twin sisters when I was little, and they had Shirley Temple ringlets below their butts and big china blue eyes. They're 18 months younger than me. And they had petticoats that blew up like inner tubes. And I got no attention when I was a kid. (laughs) Anyway, I've been in therapy about it, but... Anyway, I want to finish. You know, this whole idea, it amazes me that at eight, a little less than eight years of sobriety, I still seek, you know, I seek. But I tell you, oddly enough, it's in the seeking that I have found some faith. It's in that seeking that I have found this this code in in which I live my life by, which is to the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's in this, it's in this seeking that I have found Oddly enough, a belief system. Um, I can't always voice what it is, but I know what I believe. You know, I have a belief system today. And in 1982, at the height of my drinking and drugging, um, my best friend was diagnosed with the AIDS virus. Um, now, this, this guy and I both grew up in the Baptist church, and we harbored a very shameful secret. Now, I know y'all think it was the secret, but we harbored that too. But we harbored, when no one was home, 
And I didn't know what a drag queen was. I had no, I'm, I'm, I'm eight, nine years old. My best friend and I would uh, dress up in my mother's clothes. My mother was the perfect mother for a homosexual because she wore Jackie pillbox hats and she had falls. You remember falls and, and boots and, and, and everything. And, and we would get my mother's wigs and put on her clothes and we would get hairbrushes and we would lip sync to Diana Ross and the Supremes. <laughs> And I was always Diana. <laughs> I'd say, you're going to be the backup girl? Well, back the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> back up. I've been crying. <laughs> but anyway, my friend, my best friend that used to do this little drag thing with me when we were eight or nine years old, as we got older, because we were best friends all the way through high school, um, we never mentioned that. I think that's so odd in retrospect that as we got older, never did we mention that shameful thing that we used to dress up in my mother's clothes. Now, he took a much different path than I did. He got married. He married the prettiest girl in my church. He married the richest girl in my church. And, and they were married for a few years, and then I heard through the grapevine that they got a divorce, and my friend disappeared. You know what happens to us when we come out in the small town? We dis he disappeared from the face of the earth. Twenty years later, I was walking down the street in West Hollywood, and there was my best friend. And I said, honey, where have you been? And that's where I got that line. He said, oh, honey, I've been having a homo ho down. <laughs> and he was the first person I knew to be diagnosed with the AIDS virus, and y'all, it was terrifying. You know, AIDS is frightening today, but back then, if you visited someone in the hospital, you wore a space suit. It was and terrifying, but for some reason, I was fearless. I don't know if it was my drug use. My, I, I, don't, I was fearless. Everybody abandoned him. That's what happened in the early 80s. People died all alone, especially in a big city like L.A. You know, we had the one AIDS ward at, at the county hospital, and, and young men died all alone. And I would sit with my friend night after night after night. We would sit because he, it was scariest at night. And um, my friends would say to me, Leslie, I don't know how you do it. Well, please, I had lines of crystal meth in the bathroom. I was stealing all his meds. They get great meds, you know. And <laughs> one for you, two for mama. <laughs> and um, I would sit with him just speeding my tits off. And, and he, we would talk and giggle and, and I'd let him smoke cigarettes. He was on oxygen. <laughs> I'd tell him, be, be careful of that tank, girl. <laughs> You'll blow us to kingdom come. <laughs> and we would sit there and we would smoke cigarettes and giggle and talk about the old days. But y'all, he went crazy on me. See, we didn't know back then what we know now, that sometimes there's dementia involved. I just thought he had gone bonkers, and I didn't know who to tell, and so I would sit with him, and he would, t he would just rattle incessantly with no segue, night after night. But you know, I was tweaking so hard, a lot of it made sense. I would... <laughs> yeah, I'm with you on that one, girl, yeah. But he... He, um... There was one night I remember we had... He had been just going, just just rattling incessantly, and he, he finally calmed down, and I thought he'd gone to sleep, and I was sitting there smoking my last cigarette, and um, from the dark I heard, um, Leslie, do you think I'm being punished? And I thought, oh, girl, please, I am tweaking. <laughs> I, you are really ruining my Because, <laughs> see, that is, that is what the preachers in the Deep South were saying. The preachers in Texas were saying that AIDS was God's punishment for homosexuals. It was a tumultuous time for gay men who had been raised in the church because it made sense, to me at least. It was so frightening. And no matter how many times, in, in my friend's dementia, it became his mantra. He was like a parrot. He wouldn't let up. Do you think I'm being punished? Do, do you think that I'm being punished? And no matter how many times I said, you know, honey, they're leaning towards it. It's a virus. 
I don't think this is a moral issue. He would say, yeah, but, but do you, do you, do you think, do you, do you think I'm being punished? Three days before my friend died, he sat up in bed and he was as lucid as I had ever seen him. And, and he said, Leslie, the most amazing thing has happened. I prayed last night and, um, God spoke to me. And, you know, I have to tell you that after my friend died, I, I dedicated myself. I hit the trenches. In the 1980s, I was one of the founders of a grassroots organization called Project Nightlight. And we would go in and sit with people. And I held many, many men in my arms as they drew their last breath on earth. And I'm going to tell you what I know today. And this is from someone who can only seek God. It amazes me. I know that when one gets near the end of life's journey, they become bathed in some sort of heavenly light. I know, I've seen it, when someone gets near the end of life's journey, the telephone lines go up. Now, did my friend t- talk to God? I, y'all, I was raised in the Baptist church. I heard that all my life. And then they spoke to me. Woo! <laughs> and so, I remember I just said, oh, honey, I'm just tickled pink. <laughs> I can't wait to hear what he's saying. (laughs) You know, it went right over my head. But, you know, my friend was a tiny little burned up French fry, and he grabbed my arm, and he pulled me down, and he said, Leslie, please, this is so important, because I heard him. I heard him with these ears. I heard him in this body, and I heard him on this plane of existence. And Leslie, it is so simple. First of all, the soul has no gender. So when it's all said and done, it is not about whom one loved. That's important. No, 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 Leslie, see, what's important is the quality of that love. We're on this earth for one reason, one reason only, and that is to give quality love on a daily basis. Now, I, I, I believe that we hear what we hear when we're ready to hear it. You people that have been around the rooms know that we hear what we hear when we're ready to hear it. And at two, maybe three years of sobriety, that all came back to me and thus began my journey. You know, I love what Wayne uh, Dreyer says he says we are not human beings seeking a spiritual experience we're spiritual beings and what we're seeking is a human experience see i don't i don't worry today i know that i was born godlike i believe in my own divinity today you know i i i believe that 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 the reason that i'm standing here because uh, I buried an entire phone directory to the disease of AIDS in the 1980s and the 1990s. I believe that I have this message, you know, and I, I know why I'm here, but I have got to stay sober, you know, to deliver that message. And so that's what I do, you know, to stay sober. I keep my program as simple as possible. At the end of the day, I ask myself two questions. Did I love and did I serve? And... And that's my sobriety. Thank you so much for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.